uh, such as Google, Google Maps and all the wayfinding apps that we have on our phones and mobile devices. I think um, everyone who uses a smartphone is familiar with this technology. Uh, the other one is remote sensing. So that refers to the use of earth imagery uh, taken usually from a vertical perspective uh, from a satellite aircraft or even these days a drone. Uh, so in the past, like for instance, when I was a student, uh, these three technologies were taught separately. So GIS was its own um, discipline and 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 then the remote and and class and then um, remote sensing had a different curriculum and then usually if you wanted to study a gps or gnss you had to go to into an engineering program uh, but now there's been convergence over the years and uh, so all technologies that are used to depict and study location or location based data are known as geospatial technologies and whether we are aware of these technologies or not uh, they are pervasive and um, they're used everywhere. So you might ask, especially if you've not, if you're unfamiliar with uh, these technologies, why should you care about them? How, how, will, how does this technology benefit your students or you as an instructor? So you're able to take advantage of vast amounts of publicly available data sets. Uh, so the IT revolution has produced a lot of data that uh, data sets that in the past you had to pay a lot of money for, uh, but now those data sets are available. But in order to make use of them, you need uh, certain tools or knowledge. Uh, like for instance, the um, US Geological Survey uh, takes images of the entire planet every 16 days. And, and this data is available for free. Anybody in the world can download that the satellite imagery and, um, and analyze it. But just because it's free doesn't mean that somebody can take advantage of it. So knowing this technology can help with that. Uh, so it also helps with data visualization and analysis. Uh, so you'll see a lot of jobs uh, these days require the ability to work with data, both to visualize it and then analyze it uh, using descriptive and inferential statistics and the like. Uh, so you, you're able to do that with geospatial technology. And also what is what makes uh, it special is that you're able to view um, the data in a spatial dimension and also view changes over time. And sometimes you're not, uh, with other data analysis uh, methods or systems, you're not able to get that spatial or temporal aspect at the same time. You're also able to do uh, digital storytelling, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. Also, this technology promotes interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, so you're able to take, like for instance, in the previous slide, you have um, a street data, building data, vegetation data, and the like. So the, uh, the street data uh, that may have come from an engineer uh, the building data may have come from a, a, a contractor or, or structural engineer, street data from maybe a civil engineer, then the vegetation data could have come from a biologist. And then combining this information, then you can uh, ask uh, different uh, questions. Like for instance, are there uh, buildings that are near, uh, for instance, some uh, vegetation that that uh, has got some conservation value and the like. Uh, so so th then the, your students by learning uh, data visualization, storytelling and, and the like, they get some skills that they are able to uh, put on their resume and help them in their job. They don't have to be uh, seeking a job as a GIS specialist or analyst. Uh, they could be in a different field. They could be in marketing, emergency management, supply chain management, they could be uh, ecologists, epidemiologists. So all these are disciplines that use location data. So if your field uses location data, GIS is valuable to learn. And then also from, this can also just be a gateway uh, to learning advanced um, data analysis as, and software development uh, skills. Uh, in my case, I did work as a, as a software developer and I didn't 
enter into software development through the traditional path, which is uh, to get a degree in computer science. It was GIS that opened the door for me, and then I was able to enter that career. So, uh, so then uh, what can you do with it? Okay, so you're able to do these things, fine, but uh, what, uh, so that some of the things you're able to do with it is that you're able to map where things are. So I think everybody by now is familiar with this COVID-19 dashboard that was put together by the, one of the centers at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so since the beginning of the pandemic, this map has been the go-to reference uh, for policymakers, uh, individuals, as well as the media. And I remember at when the, right at the, even before it was uh, classified as a pandemic, um, myself and um, uh, Professor Tong Cheng in the biology department uh, took the, the data back in um, February 2020 and started to map the outbreak for her class. And she was, uh, she, she was able to use the data then and she's still doing it up to, up to now. Uh, so, but it expanded. Uh, first, the focus was just showing uh, COVID cases, death, and deaths, um, and hosp and um, and yeah, COVID uh, cases and deaths, and and then there also recoveries in the for countries. But then over time, you started to see subdivision, uh, political subdivisions such as uh, states and provinces, and the like. And this is an interactive map, so you can zoom in. It's not static. You can zoom in. Uh, click on a dot and get some attributes. So like, for instance, uh, this is data from Belarus in the last uh, 28 uh, days. Um, I'm not sure they picked the right country given the political situation in the world. But anyway, so here it shows the cases in the last 28 days, uh, deaths, and then the total cases um, that have occurred there and, and deaths in the country. So you can do that for any other part part of the world. Uh, so so uh, GIS and geospatial technology help you uh, see where things are. If you're a teacher, uh, you can have your students create thematic maps. So these are maps that use colors and symbols to show a geographic distribution. So this is a map of the languages of India. So this is um, designed for a GIS class to, uh, uh, you can use it for several disciplines. So one discipline could be a GIS class where the students are learning how to create uh, well-designed maps of this type. And so the students are given step-by-step -step instructions to go through this. Uh, you could also use this in a world languages class if you happen to want to teach about the uh, distribution of languages in, in India. Uh, you could also use this in a cultural geography class if you want to talk about or teach students about the uh, distribution of languages. The another thing that you can do is the digital storytelling. So this one has become a is a very popular use of GIS. So what you're able to do is create interactive websites that have text, have uh, video have images and maps to tell a story. So this is a story maintained by the National Geographic following the trek around the world by uh, anthropologist and explorer Paul Salopek. So in this, this story map is one where he is in India. And so you have text hyperlinks and he called his project uh, the Out of Eden Walk. So he started where the origins of man were in East Africa. And his goal is to fall, walk through uh, Eurasia into North America. So the, for the India leg, he, uh, that story is being told, told through this web page known as a story map. And you can see the, the text, the, the, the maps that change. Uh, then as you go through the website, you can see there, there's also video. And you're also able to put in any multimedia. So if you have uh, sounds, uh, you can also insert that into a story map. And so you decide the story that you want to tell and then lay it out and then use uh, this, um, uh, this platform to create uh, these, these maps. Then 
once they are created, you can share them and um, and show them on any uh, device. Uh, this is another thing. Another thing you can do with uh, GIS is show change. So NASA has this World of Change website, and on the World of Change website, you're able to see satellite imagery of uh, chosen or some curated locations. So this particular set shows urbanization in Dubai, uh, U, uh, United Arab Emirates since uh, 2000 to 2011. It's using what is known as a false color composite so that uh, green vegetation, actively growing vegetation shows in red. So I'm going to play this animation and you can see the changes, uh, change in urbanization uh, in Dubai uh, between and during that 11 year span. And uh, so you can see that artificial island off the coast there and the Palm uh, Jumeirah. And so this is provided as an animation, but also you have an option just to see uh, the uh, images, to get see the images in a standalone format. Uh, then you're not only able to visualize things, but you can also analyze data sets. So in this case, it's a tornado passing through a neighborhood. So if you do have the building outlines of footprints, you can find out the tornadoes that were impacted. And so how would you start to use these uh, tools? Uh, so we'll talk about some of the techniques and some of these you can implement right away, but you don't have to pay um, a lot of money to get these tools. Uh, you can start with free ones. So Google Earth is one and uh, Google Earth Pro, which you install on a, a Mac or a Windows computer is, is a good one. Uh, ArcGIS Online, which we used with uh, Pearl, is a, is a good option. There's a free version. And then NASA Earth Observatory has got daily Earth imagery that's available for free. And NASA Worldview is also another free, uh, free app. Uh, so today we'll show you uh, what we did and give you some ideas to get started uh, right away. Okay, back to you, Pearl. Um Thanks, Michaela. I'm going to let you actually wait. Uh, let me share. <laughs> I was going to let you keep the slides up because I think you're up after this, too. Okay. Hang on. I'm having trouble with my sharing. Okay. So um, I'm going to just give you a background to our collaboration and how Michaela and I ended up doing this. So back in 2020, um, I was teaching early English literature online for the first time, and normally I do include maps for early England because our students don't actually know a lot about England. They don't know necessarily what counties are important. And so the first thing I usually do is just orient them with a map of England. In the online version of the course, though, though I thought that a static map would not be very dynamic and interesting. So I asked Makila if there's something that I could do in the course, and Makila being an amazing person, <laughs> helped me map a book and create an assignment fully collaborative that the students could do. So this is way above and beyond uh, replying to my email saying with some links. He, we collaborated on a project. And so this is what the project was. We created an assignment based on a, on a contemporary document that um, documented an outbreak of bubonic plague in London in 1665. The book is called Journal of a Plague Year. It was written by, uh, it's a, what's called creative nonfiction. So parts of it were fictional, but parts of it were nonfictional. And what was nonfictional was the caseload of bubonic plague that traveled through London in 1665. And so I assigned this book in early English literature because it was very close to what we were living. And Makila was able to take some data from the book and map it and did a uh, time-lapse map of a plague that that traveled through London in 1665. And I'm gonna to toss it back over to Michaela, who's gonna show you, demonstrate how he did that. Okay, all right, thanks, Paul. All right, so the, so what I'll start by showing what the students created in the assignment. 
So what the students did, so they created two maps. So one map showed the uh, burials uh, due to the plague uh, during that year, 1665. Uh, so what you see here are the parish boundaries. And then the, so, so London was divided by, was um, the, the subdivisions were by uh, parish given the importance of the church at that time. So here you can see, uh, and they did talk about the, in the book about the, the uh, on the west side of the city, like the Martin, Martin's Fields, St. Saint, Saint Martin's in the Fields Parish area having fewer cases than, uh, let's say, the, the, the locations to the south. But that's not necessarily apparent when you're reading the text, but by mapping that these distributions, then the students could could see them. Then the other one was an animated map that just showed the the deaths by month. Uh, so what you see, the red dots are the the deaths th through that year, starting November 1664, going into fall uh, 1665. Uh, so the so the red dots are, represent deaths in the in the parish. So reported deaths. So, so this was made, so the students created both maps and were able to use them as they went through uh, the, the readings that Pearl gave, gave them. This was made possible by a, a project uh, by the Digital Research Center at Hofstra University. What they had done was that they had gone through the book and they had, um, mentioned location, so they geo, geo referenced, uh, they taken uh, uh, d dates that deaths were mentioned, and then where possible they had indicated a location. So like for instance, you can see in 1664, the week of December 20th to 27th, the St. Bride's Parish, no deaths, but then St. James Clerkenwell has got eight deaths. So. So this information was provided in a tabular format. So what I did was to go through and then pick the locations that had a parish, because some of them did not have parishes. So the entries that had a parish, I picked those. And there, there was a, a website where they mentioned that they had taken an old map, a map of London uh, from around that time, and they had uh, traced outlines of the parishes and it provided it in a format that was accessible in GIS. So I got that that file. There were a few modifications to make to that file to complete the parishes. So I made those modifications and then there I had the data that the students could use. In terms of the assignment that Pearl mentioned, uh, so they got a packet and um, the packet uh, mentioned, and this we collaborated together to write this a packet and to make sure that it fitted, it was a good fit for the class. Uh, so they would, so the objectives were to learn how to visualize um, the 17th century London using maps and multimedia, and then compare the the London in both times using maps, and then visualize the spread of the plague. Okay, so then the so they had the first thing wasn't ArcGIS, they used the map of early modern London, which was also from around that time, but it, this, this map was created from a block, an engraved map that was en engraved on a, on a large block of wood. And then if this was transferred to a website. But the, so what it shows you is London within this, the walls, and you can see that, okay, in the outlying areas, you can see fields. So what we asked the students to do was to look at, in the book, they talk about this uh, Bishop's Gate Street and Bishop's Gate. So the London Wall, which was, um, which had been there from uh, when the Romans, uh, from Roman times. Uh, so that wall was, was there and marked the boundary at the time. And so you can see that on this, um, and this is an interactive map. So by zooming in, you can see that on the along this Bishop's Gate Street, once you move north of Bishop's Gate, you see agricultural fields. 
So that was the extent of the city then. Okay, so then we asked students to go to Google Earth and view Bishop's Gate today. Uh, so you, this is uh, Google Maps and you can see the, well, there's London's, the L London walls. So there's some sections still there, but this is right in the heart of the city. So with tall uh, high rises and we asked them even to, to use this, um, this street view feature and then to, to go out and 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 see that that area so so i'm going to just drop this icon there and so we had them go in and interact with google street view to see how london looks today and then compare that to how it might have looked back then also it was important to point out to the world that the as far as uh, Europeans were concerned the world did not look like it looked today. So the lots of parts of the world were mentioned in the book as places where the uh, plague might have originated like Cyprus and the Levant and so on. But the world back then to Europeans was not had some, so this is a map of the world. So the, some areas were known and many other areas were not known. And uh, so they were filled in with uh, some imagination. So, so that also we asked the students to, to keep in mind. And then they went through and uh, built the exercise. So they had step-by-step -step instructions to, to guide them through uh, working through this. And also there was a video too that they could use to guide them through the packet. And then at the end of the exercise, uh, they generated a URL, which was then submitted to Pearl. Okay, Pearl, back to you. This time I'll, I'll stay with the PowerPoint. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so that was the initial collaboration. So that was just background to what we're gonna talk about in terms of the, con the theme of this conference, which is about teaching Asia today. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm going to just show you how we took that same experience and are applying it now to uh, an Asian context. So, uh, I'm developing a course on Asian, on Asian literature, Asian, Asian American literature, literature of the Asian, of Asian descent authors. Uh, there's a fairly famous novel by a South Asian descent writer, Lahiri, who portrays the life of, uh, the son of Bengali immigrants in, uh, United States. And his, the character's name is Gogol and his parents are Ashima and Ashok. So I'm going to show you, and if you're a humanities person right now, I'm going to do something that's going to feel like a bizarre thing to do. I'm going to take this novel and put it into a spreadsheet. <laughs> so if you are in humanities, you're like, Pearl, that's crazy. That's not what I signed up for. It's how we integrate the humanities with this GIS technology. So in some ways, if you're a humanities person thinking this is nuts, it is a little outside the box of what we normally do. So we have a novel, a beautiful story about a character and his experiences growing up South Asian in the United States, South Asian American. And I'm gonna take that and I put it into a spreadsheet. Now, the reason we have to put it into a spreadsheet is so that we can integrate it with this GIS technology. So I'm going to show you um, what, that process of taking a novel and putting in a spreadsheet is like. And Michaela, since we're running out of time a little bit, I'm probably going to skip the Cambridge portion, if that's okay. And okay. maybe just go to the chart, the India context. Is that right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So here's a spreadsheet of a couple of chapters of the novel. So if you're looking at this going, what? I'm going to explain what happened. So uh, with Michaela's guidance, and I want to just say that we're, Michaela and I are doing something that's never really been done before. So we're kind of, I'm not saying making this up as go, as we go along, but there's really not a lot of precedent. So Michaela tells me what he needs in order to map something and I try to do it. And I took uh, the introduction to GIS course for a hot six weeks <laughs> and ended up dropping it because I'm an English teacher, but I tried. <laughs> so what happened, what Michaela tells 
it works me through is a uh, is figuring out what data from the novel has to be put in this format so that we can then map it using some of the platforms you just mentioned. So the narrative of the story is that there's a character named Ashok who walks the streets of Calcutta reading books. Now, for an American student or student in another country, so now we have international students in our courses all over the world. So I may have a student in Cambodia who's reading with me. Um, the image of a man walking the streets while he reads books doesn't necessarily signify anything until you map it. When you map it, you start to understand what this is telling us about the character. Because when we look at this location, so I'm going to do some use some of the tools that uh, Makila has talked about. And before I even do that, I'll say that one thing Makila did teach me was that when you're mapping. So let's say I'm going to map a location in Cambridge where the character was born. And I'm going to do that here just to demonstrate it. Um, and this is the Cambridge location, but then I'll go over to the Indian location. Um, we have uh, the Cambridge character was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The father attends. Um, MIT is an engineer and one of the things I had to learn to do was take a latitude and longitude from the URLs and put them in the spreadsheet. So this is the latitude and I would copy it here. Oops, I did not do that right. Hold on. So we're going to take this latitude highlighted and I'm going to put it here. So this is going to give me the latitude of the location. Now, the longitude of the location is this negative number before the comma, and I'm going to put it in the spreadsheet. So these are the to and from locations of a character. And then using the Google Maps, you can map that character's journey. When you're teaching literature, it's really hard for students will blow past a really important detail because they can't visualize it. When you start to use this kind of mapping, then we can have a fairly deep conversation about what it meant that this character took this journey along these streets. So another location in the novel that's fairly important, or at least a way a character is characterized as Ashok walks the streets while reading books. So I took using the methods that um, Mikhail has taught me, we can take this location and put it into Google Maps. And so what we end up is we end up in the location where the character is walking. So now I'm in the, the place that this character walks. Now for a student, you can now start to show the street where the student is walking. And we can start to visualize it for the student. So let's say I do what Michaela talked about, and we take the street view and we take a location on the map and we drop it here. And now we can see the streets that this character would walk in if it was 2012 or 2010. So now I know what the street looks like from a contemporary version. But when you're teaching and the characters walking down the streets in 1961 or 1968, we also have to go back in time a little. So in the Cambridge location, we now see what the character would have been walking through in Harvard Square in 1960s in Cambridge. And so now we can talk to the student about what would it have been like for a Bengali immigrant to walk from this kind of location to this lo location. And so in the mapping of the character who walks through Kolkata on Chauringi and Garayat, we can get both the, the current view, which is this, but we can also get an archival view. And in this archival view, we can have a conversation about what it would have been like to walk this street reading a book. And if you're walking this street reading a book in 1961, you are now telling the students or the students that are discovering something really interesting about the character. The character would have had to have been focused and aware at the same time to walk this street while reading a book. Now imagine the same character immigrates six or seven years later and the street the character walks is this one. And so now we can have a much more detailed conversation about what that process of immigration means for this character. So the benefit of GIS and integrating it into humanities is this kind of um, transformative visualization that normally we would not get if we didn't bring GIS into this 
uh, conversation. And there's one more event, and I'll show you the spreadsheet of the novel. That's the word I never thought I'd hear myself stay. Um, there is an accident that happens to a character 209 kilometers from Calcutta. It's a train accident, and the father has this accident um, that transforms his view of life. And I'm going to pass it over to Michaela, and he's going to show you how to map this using Google Earth. Now, when we talk about it, just literally as a narrative, oh, he he had an accident, but it's really hard to just visualize what this accident could look like without GIS. So I'm going to pass it over to Michaela, and Michaela's going to uh, map the train derailment. So Michaela, back to you. Kila, are you trying to, to talk? I, I oh, yeah, okay. I was muted. Okay. So I'm going to show you uh, how you can use um, Google Earth Pro uh, for vis visualization. So Google Earth Pro is quite versatile. It's uh, free uh, and available for anyone to download. And I believe many of you have already tried it. It has, um, you can not only pinpoint locations, but then you can do some basic measurements. Uh, you have some tools, a ruler tool that allows you to measure lines uh, straight just between, I mean, using a simple line with a start and end, that's a line. A path, you can uh, follow a line with many vertices. Then you can also uh, calculate the area of polygons and um, circles and, and the like, and do some 3D um, measurements. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. So the, we know that this, the, the locations, so the, uh, so we had the train journey was starting in, uh, in Aura in West Bengal. So we, so this, this tool being a Google tool as a, as a directions, uh, uh, directions functionality. So that's what I'm using here. And then, you, so then you type the, the destination. And then when you, you select to get the directions, it shows you the journey uh, by train, but you have different modes of transportation. So you can see it by car and then you can see it by uh, so if you had to do the journey by by car it would take you yeah, anywhere between seven about seven and a half hours to nine and a half uh, so a train journey about seven hours you could also try to walk and let's see what it tells you okay yeah, so, so it will take some time. So 72 to 74 hours. All right, so we're interested in the train journey. So it will create the starting, the starting point will be in a green icon, the end point will be in a red icon. And then you're, you're able to see and not only the, the route, but then you can zoom out. So, so for some context to see where within India or South Asia, this journey took place. So if there are references in the text about uh, what the what was being what was being seen outside the, the train window in terms of the topography or features, uh, you can what you can do is here is then this is you not only have a vertical view, you can also tilt the landscape. So you notice that we're going through very flat topography. There is Whenever you move your mouse along the, the map, you do get the elevation. So as you move along, you can see that there aren't many changes in elevation. So if that's being referenced, uh, you can you can see that, and then uh, just follow along and 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 see that. Then now there was the accident that was reported, and so that accident uh, took place about 209 kilometers into the journey. So what, so for that to estimate where that would be, and um, so the estimation just depends on 
how much time you want to spend following this path. Uh, because of time, just do a rough estimate. So it's the ruler tool, the path, uh, path tab. And if you want your students to learn a metric system, you can have them do it uh, in kilometers working. And you just, right now we're just trying to get a rough estimate. So, so not necessarily uh, trace the outline. Hang on. Okay. So I'll not trace it in a lot of detail, but I'll just demonstrate how that functionality works. So we're trying to go move along until we see a point that's about 200 and uh, okay, so there we had gone too far. So it's right about somewhere there. So in this vicinity, say I'd taken my time and uh, so and we found a location, then we can then mark it with a push pin, call it accident location. Okay, then uh, you could even then save it as an as an image and even with a small map and and the like so that then if you zoom out then you can see where within the journey about where this took place and if there are questions that Paul would like to ask about the the area what what is around there of course this is um a long time after this no uh, the that this journey took place, but if even for contemporary time, it can be just questions asked, ask the students to view this area and then uh, respond to, to some questions. Okay. okay. Michaela, is it me now or are you? Yeah, it's you now. Okay. Okay, so that's basically an example of going back to the spreadsheet we created for the novel. Um, the row that Makila was working on is um, an event in the novel that was entered into a spreadsheet and it was called Ashok's train accident. And so these are some of the details. If you're mapping a novel, you're trying to find events that are can be geolocated, georeferenced and that are relevant thematically to understanding the novel, understanding the character, understanding themes. And so it helps a student who might be reading about a country they've never been to, to be able to visualize the landscape, the geography, the topography with GIS. Without it, they will basically place the events in a context that they understand. And that may not actually end you up with an interpretation of the novel that's the one that the writer would have intended. So this is why GIS is really useful. So in our last slide, um, we wanted to just talk about some overviews of why this kind of collaboration is really important to understanding global under for global understanding, which is part of the, I think the work we're doing in the summit is that it assists students in visualizing scenes that they cannot if they've never been to this country or the location. Um, it shows the impact of migration and travel on a character's perspective. So when we're reading novels in my discipline where characters travel from one, another, one country to another and create lives, you really have a much better appreciation and therefore empathy and compassion for the characters, the mental journeys they have to make, the psychological ones, because the change in geography is as much an impactor, impact as all the other things, education, culture, et cetera. Um, they can also uh, connect the, the relationship between distances and time frames. So the way we worked from the contemporary mapping to archival maps and archival scenes, I think helps show the change in a person or character over time. We've also found that it enhances online teaching and learning. So it's another dynamic engagement in an online situation. So we're creating a learning community that would be an online course. So if you're looking for higher engagement in an online course, particularly in uh, a lit course, this is this GIS is more hands-on than just reading and writing. 
And then I uh, definitely think that McKeel and I have benefited from this interdisciplinary professional development, this interdisciplinary collaborative teaching and learning, because I took a GIS class, everybody. <laughs> and I'm now actually presenting this work that we're doing together at um, a GIS conference in July. So now I'm going to a geography conference. So that'll be interesting. <laughs> okay, so McKeel, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, mainly, I think you've um, summarized it very well, just the a little bit more on the interdisciplinary part. So that is of high value to our students because a lot of times they don't appreciate the connections between disciplines. Uh, so they will take they'll take a, an English class, but not see necessarily how that can be connected a literature class in this case to uh, be enhanced by other disciplines. In, in if they were to take a GIS class, they might just be focused just on the tools themselves. So the mechanics of running a tool, but having this kind of collaboration shows them how these tools are applied in the real world. And that's the important thing. The important thing isn't the mechanics of the tools, the buttons they're clicking. It's the, the impact uh, that, they, uh, that they have. And then of course, yeah, just to echo what Pearl said, this this, this uh, it just gives us a way to, to work together and to learn new things about teaching and about uh, the world by working across disciplines. And I think this is the one thing that um, our students need to face in order to deal with the complex problems that they are going to face once they leave uh, the school. So I think we all know the big challenges we have with climate change, migration, social justice and the like. Uh, one discipline cannot solve all of them. Uh, so we all need to work together and uh, GIS allows us to do that. Thank you, Makila. I think, do we have questions? So I have yes. a question that the, um, the spreadsheet of the novel, I mean, is that, <laughs> Is that something that the two of you actually developed or has that been? Yeah, this doesn't exist anywhere between, except between us. So it is kind of innovative in the sense that as a literature scholar and teacher, there's no other precedent for research on this. There's no lit review. There's no, for the first of my life, there's no lit review. There's nowhere I'm gonna go to look for comparable work. There isn't any. So that's why the presentation I'm doing in July at Esri Education Summit is so important because that's where we're going to sort of um, reveal the collaboration. So basically, Mukil and I have to kind of align our understanding of our disciplines and I have to figure out what he needs to have in order to do GIS and he has to know what my data environment is like. So things don't come out like straight numbers. I have to go figure out how to quantify an experience, which is kind of weird, but actually in this COVID land, it actually works because we are quantifying these kinds of human experiences. So the GIS platform really works really well in that kind of meaning of disciplines. So, yeah, I don't have any, we don't really have anything else to look to. Akil, I don't know if you want to add to that. The, no, just that, the, I mean, the spreadsheet is the basis for, for the mapping because it allows you to capture because at the end of the day, you need to capture location in, in uh, the coordinates and you need to you have a tabular form. So each incident needs to be like a row. And then the key thing is that you need the coordinates and they don't have to be lat long, lat long latitude longitude is the easiest to work with. So that's what we're using. And then the other, th the other columns that you'd have there are just the important attributes or features that you want to to get. So as a GIS person, I couldn't, I mean, all I, I needed was the coordinates and the attributes, but what they were, so what was the import, what the attributes were, what we were going to map, that had to come from Pearl. So that that's where the discussion of what she was trying to get her students to, to map or, or visualize through the mapping. So she had to educate me on that. And then I said, okay, based on that, uh, so I think there was one case where uh, she was describing the first one where there was a, f a from and to, 
So initially, I thought that it was just one location, but after describing, she said, oh, no, I want to, the students to understand a journey from one, this, this location to the other one. So that, that needed. Uh, so that's how we came up even with f the four columns so that four columns for coordinates. So to capture from and a two location. So, yeah, so, if, so if somebody is work, so the GIS person working on this really needs the uh, person who's going to use this data to shape it, to shape what it's going to be. Yeah. Julie. Uh, first of all, just amazing. Um, it's what a really cool project. So I'm very impressed. Um, it, what has the student reaction been? How well, they, I just, have, you, have you noticed how they've been impacted by incorporating this? Well, we did. I knew I was going to need that data. Three years in administrative work didn't taught me a few things. Um, <laughs> so I did some scholarship. Of I did action research. So we did some follow up. Uh, we had the written assignment, then I did some follow up questionnaires evaluative to figure out, okay, well, did this meet my learning outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. The problem was in the fall 2020, the student sample was so small because of where we were in our online lives that I only had eight students in the class. And five did the project or, you know, some percentage. But generally, the experience was because, and also it's, you know, fall 2020, so we were at the very beginning of the pandemic. So they can really connected with visualizing London during a pandemic because they were experiencing their lives in a pandemic. So that's where the resonance really happened. So I saw the benefit in that um, when you teach an early modern period, most of the visualization in a student's mind is kind of abstract and generally they default to what they know. And so you're trying to teach them, oh, well, this is what it would have been like without running water. This is what it would have been like without transit. But with the GIS, they could actually walk down a street in 17th century London and they could see, oh, this is where the stalls would have been. This is where they did social distancing. This is how the food handlers used the food. So Makila added a lot of value with all of these videos and making having the students make the map and then comment on contemporary London and uh, 17th century London. So the, the small sample of evaluation I got was very positive. The one negative may have been that, um, and we, Mikhail and I talked about this, it was like all of a sudden they're in a GIS class. And so that pre-knowledge of latitude, longitude, um, they didn't have that. So it made it harder for Mikhail to design the assignment. And I think Mikhail, we did talk about, there was some things that, in a geography class that they would know, but they weren't in a geography class, they were in a lit right. class. Right. So if I, we were we were planning a learning community, so I think we'll align more of that. Michaela, do you have anything else you wanna add? I think you've uh, answered it quite well there. Yeah, I think okay. that, the, and also just making the assignments, especially for students who are not in GIS, creating the assignment in such a way that it doesn't take away from the discipline that is integrating the technology because it can be built in such a way that it just becomes all about the um, the mapping and the geography and if it's if it's that's not the the point then they miss the 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 purpose of the assignment yeah so yeah so so in some earlier i think with pearl I've gone through this a few times but i think the first time i tried it this kind of thing it was just too heavy on gis and um and so it took away from what the instructor was trying to focus on. So, yeah. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Okay, you guys cannot see my face, but yeah, I think that it's gonna be amazing and <laughs> really good luck in the learning community. Do a, a lot of advertisement, a lot of flyers, <laughs> Because, yeah, you know, you, you guys have to make it. It's, it has been a challenge. I don't know why these last two years to offer learning communities. So do everything that you can, okay? So the students know about the class. And of course, we will okay. help you guys too. So All right, thanks. congratulations okay. again. Thank, Thank you. you. Could I ask the uh, attenders a question? The humanities, anybody in humanities, liberal arts? I've been doing this on my own. If you're in the liberal arts, 
does this look insane? <laughs> this is like, I would never do this, Pearl. I would never break up a novel and put it in a spreadsheet. That's not what I signed up for. Um, so I, I feel like the hard sell is in my discipline because it's not how we do things. So I'm just wondering if you're in the humanities or liberal arts or languages, if this just seems like too out of the box. I think that is perfect, Pearl, for a learning community class. Uh, I, as you guys know, I'm not in humanities and I don't know everything that you guys do. But based on um, your presentation and Makila's presentations, I think that is great for a learning community class. I, I am not sure about a separate class by itself, but for mm -hmm. a learning community, you have all my support if it means okay. anything. Thank you. Kim, you're in German. What do you think? Yeah, so, literature. Well, I had worked with um, Makila to use story mapping for study abroad classes, the Hume 115, um, and for doing story mapping in some of the upper level German classes. And it worked really, really well. Um, I think my only challenge also was that it took them quite a bit of time to learn how to make the story map itself. Um, but right. that was that was the, the only hurdle. There was a lot of benefit um, along the lines of what you described today for the students to do it that way. And when they had their final product, they were really pleased with it. And it gave them a much better picture of like an individual city that they were investigating. Um, and for the ones who did it for to wrap up their study abroad trips, it gave them a chance to reflect and uh, really put themselves back in all of those places uh, to, mm -hmm. you know, so connect the feelings with the experiences and the, um, yeah, I guess just the cultural knowledge. So I, I really liked having them do it. The next time I do a study abroad trip, I'm definitely going to have them do stuff with geospatial technology because I think it adds that really unique perspective. Great. Thanks, Kim. I'm glad to hear that. And I might email you or talk to you about it later. Yeah, Joyce. Yeah, hi. I'm Pearl. I could relate to taking the GIS class as a non GIS person. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, Makila, God bless you for taking on people that have no sense of how that works. My brain doesn't work that way, <laughs> but um, but I really appreciate <clears throat> taking the class. And um, Pearl, you've given me courage to try again, because I think um, at one point I wanted to do a project, but I was intimidated by what I had learned about GIS. And so I just felt like I couldn't do it, but um, but just knowing that you 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 kind of struggle in that area as well in terms of being a literature person, um, maybe I will I will try it again. <laughs> so well, thank maybe you. we can have a liberal arts cohort in the GIS class and we'll be a little study group. Yeah, no, that would yeah. be great. Or even yeah, and it doesn't have to be formal. Just get some people together and can just work with you guys. And the tools also have gotten a bit easier to use, and also in terms of um, approaching these things, I think that it can be structured in a way that doesn't make it as complex. I think one of the issues before was that you had to do a lot of data preparation outside GIS before you bring it in. But now the, there are lots of data sets that are embedded within the software. So you, you just have to do a, do a search and check a box and the data is in there rather than doing, I mean, the stuff that we used to do before that's gone. Um, yeah, I mean, at least you, I mean, it's still there, but you don't have to. There are options now. There are more options. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? One more thing. Tell your kids to take a geography class. See how important <laughs> it is. You see it now, right? Longitude and latitude, they don't know anything. So if they take a geography <laughs> class, they're all set. So you guys are going to do great. Yeah, okay, we'll make it. Well, hopefully my lit class will be the gateway drug to geography. <laughs> uh, uh, Nelly, are we at time? Um, we're right at time. Um, so thank you, Pearl and Mukila. Thanks. This was really interesting. And I'm still wrapping my mind around how you map. Yeah, <laughs> you map things that are not explicitly stated how you map them, but uh, this is fantastic. Um, 
Uh, just to let everybody know, um, our next uh, International Education Summit is slated for November 4th, which is a Friday of the fall semester. And our, our theme for that will be sustainability and conservation. So we are calling, we're putting a call out for proposals. So if you want to send a proposal into us, um, we'll send out an email soon. So. I, I want to also thank everybody for uh, coming in and, and enjoying these great speakers and uh, all this uh, information we learned today a lot of food for thoughts uh, i want to please uh, urge you to share feedback i put two links on the chat uh, we can only uh, improve if we you know if we know what we're doing that is working and what it's not uh, so please your opinion is uh, well appreciated and uh, thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest. Of the okay. yeah, All right. Bye bye. Have yeah, a nice have a good day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Happy birthday. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.